Coming up on this digital perspective, the polls have closed and results are now in across the state of New York. And after a polarized midterms around the country, on this edition of Perspectives, I'm joined by two analysts who will help break down some of the key factors and some of the key results and those directly impacting the state of New York. So we encourage you to stay tuned because Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Jaime, starts now. What's on your mind? Let them know. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Let them know. Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, you speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective with shines a light. Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life. Make a difference in someone's life. In your heart and your mind, share your perspective. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Hyman, and as always, you can join us on our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV and our website at Bronxnet.org. If you're looking to reach me personally, of course, don't feel free to reach out to me on social media. Darren C. Hyman, that is on Facebook, and then also on Instagram and Twitter at DC Jaime 23 There you can find some information as well as some inspiration as well. Coming up on today's show, we look at the midterm elections and the elections right here in the state of New York. New York State Governor Kathy Hochul, who became New York's first female governor when she succeeded former Governor Andrew Cuomo after his resignation, is seeking a full term. And actually, votes say that she has actually regained a first full term as elected governor, Representative Lee Geldon, he was hoping to become the first Republican to win statewide in 20 years, plus around the country. We'll talk about what's happening with the midterm elections as Republicans thought to have a serious stronghold that is now in jeopardy. Joining me now to share more e- uh, details on this and share their perspectives, I should say, we've got two outstanding gentlemen. Michael Blake, founder and CEO of Atlas Strategy, Group Incorporated. He also served for three terms as assembly member of the New York State Assembly, representing the 79th Assembly District in the Bronx from 2014 to 2010. And then also joining us, we've got attorney Adam Rodriguez uh, Esquire. He's a partner at Blakely Platt and Schmidt LLP. And we're bl- glad to have them both. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Great to be with you, Darren. Darren, thank you for having me. And Mike, good to be with you. Absolutely. Good. Let me talk a little bit about New York State overall. And uh, of course, New York State Governor Kathy Hochul uh, is appeared to be reelected. A lot of concern because they felt as though uh, Lee Zeldin was going to be able to do major work. Uh, Adam, give me your perspective on this. Uh, Where did Republicans fall short? Well, I think it's it's a question of numbers, Darren, really, uh, in a state where the, the registration disadvantage uh, between Democrats and Republicans is something like three or four to one. Uh, I don't I don't see it as a negative, really, that Lee was able to, at this point, have 47 plus percent of the vote. I mean, he was in, within striking distance. And we know that the governor and others were very concerned with what was about to happen on Tuesday, so much so that, you know, the president came in uh, and started campaigning in New York State. And I think the last time that happened uh, on the eve of a gubernatorial election was when uh, Mario Cuomo lost to Governor George Pataki. So although, you know, at this point, and, and as far as I know, Lee Zeldin hasn't conceded the race. I think there are a lot of votes that still to be counted, uh, although the race has been called by m- many of the media outlets for Governor Hochul. Uh, I think that the message that Republicans and Lee Zeldin in particular were, were pushing um, was that the governor, uh, and frankly, the one party rule here in New York was sort of tone deaf to, uh, was, was the issue of crime. It was the number one issue on the voters' minds. And when you have uh, someone who's sort of registrationally disadvantaged as Lee Zeldin coming within striking distance, I think, you know, it would be wise for the governor, to the extent she is reelected, um, to take note uh, in her in her administration going forward. Mike, let me bring you in on this one here. Uh, obviously, Governor Kathy Hochul excited about the fact that she appears to be reelected, uh, but not... Uh, a landslide victory, very close. Uh, and of 
First, Lee Zeldin saying, listen, uh, there's some things that the governor's going to have to pay attention to from a Democratic side. Uh, how do you view this this race? I think that sometimes we get ridiculous in these conversations, right? Like the reality is she was, she won. She's up by about five and a half, six points, uh, which you're supposed to win a statewide race. The Republicans haven't won in 20 years. Uh, and we're having a conversation around the margins as opposed to, did you win? Second, uh, to the point that Adam raised about crime, crime was not the top issue. That's literally the New York times actually proved that again, about an hour or so ago, uh, statewide. And if that was the case, then Lee Zeldin probably wins. Uh, you had some races that were impacted by in Long Island. Uh, Republicans did have four uh, pickups to retiring districts uh, themselves. Uh, but we, we can't ignore the fact uh, you have a, a Democratic sweep statewide, a, a Democratic supermajority that still exists in the chambers uh, itself. And then all four ballot proposals in New York City uh, went for yes, three of which around racial justice. And so I think just practically, uh, we, we, we get too caught up in trying to articulate to ourselves uh, that, well, this might have been a challenging night. Well, challenging night, according to what? Because she didn't win by 20 points because she didn't win by 15 points. Uh, she won the election, as did our statewide races uh, itself. Uh, and, and equally to the point about a, a, a president coming in, I, I would think anyone uh, would want a president of their sitting party to come campaign for them uh, and what is happening. I, I do think, Darren, what is also critical, though, uh, is the, the arguments that were being made uh, by Lee Zeldin uh, and uh, many of the Republicans, not just here, but across the country, uh, was pure race baiting, race fear mongering of nonsense. Right. The, the framing of, well, you don't feel safe. They didn't they didn't have visuals of, of white men in these commercials that weren't making you feel safe. Uh, it was skewed images of black and brown people that they've tried to create there. Uh, you look at again, go out of New York, go down to Georgia, uh, where they literally ran commercials talking about the anti-racism happening against white communities. Uh, and so when we talk through the issues itself, uh, they couldn't articulate that they had a better plan to create jobs, couldn't articulate how they would help your schools, couldn't articulate how they would address what health care, couldn't articulate how we would have a four point two billion dollar bond out focused on environmental justice. The argument that was being made is that you don't feel safe. And those people, whoever these people are, are the reasons that you don't feel safe. Uh, and so the reasons why. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, not just in New York, but across the country, Democrats had a damn good night in the midst of all that is happening in the country is that people want for you to give them a reason to vote for them, not just the other person is bad. And if the Republicans will really take a true analysis, look at 2016. At the end of the day, Hillary Clinton did not beat Donald Trump because she tried to make the conversation of he's just bad rather than why you're good. Uh, and so that is the assessment that one has to make. Uh, and, and, and and compare to uh, and then continue to move forward and in, in, in realizing at the end of the day, uh, the conversation we're really having is that Democrats had significant wins up and down the ballot all across New York State. Uh, Adam, talk to me a little bit about, about voter turnout. Uh, some people were uh, pretty surprised at the amount of people who came out to vote uh, across statewide. Uh, how do you assess voter turnout and how do you think that played out with the Republican Party? I haven't seen the numbers, Darren, but to the extent it was high, I mean, that's a good thing. It should be high. You know, I mean, I would love it if there's 100 percent participation. I mean, that's the way it should be. Um, but to sort of to respond a little bit to what Mike said about about Lee and, and the governor, you know, Lee's performance, he outperformed. Right. I don't think anyone can dispute that. Um, and I think that outperformance is what fueled a lot of the more nuanced victories that Republicans had in New York State. Right. Including out in Long Island. But also including in the Hudson Valley, my friend Mike Lawler, who I've known for a long time, you know, he he beat the chairman of the Democratic Campaign Congressional Committee, right, uh, Sean Patrick Maloney. Uh, Sean conceded, I think, this morning. Uh, Mark Molinaro, also in the Hudson Valley. You know, I think Lee's performance at the top of the ballot helped fuel these victories down below, which ultimately I think is going to lead to the the House changing hands um, and eliminating one party rule in Washington, which again I think is something that most people think is probably not a good thing. Talk to me a little bit about this, Mike. Uh, when we talk on a national level, Democrats were uh, looking at this race and saying, listen, you know, we had to get our voice out, our message heard. Uh, Republicans were talking about a possible shellacking. There were a lot of people worried about uh, if a shellacking would actually take place. But what we're seeing right now is uh, in some states, too close to call. We know that we can't call the Senate yet. Uh, we know as far as the House is concerned, 
that's still up for grabs. But yet and still the landslide victory that was being uh, proposed by Republicans uh, didn't seem to come to pass. Well, it didn't uh, because they don't have a message. And, and again, I just think like we just got to be very clear about this. I, I, we, I don't have the energy or the time for us to dance around that. What was the message being conveyed? You don't feel safe. That literally was their framing. There was no argument about how we're going to help you with your communities uh, around inflation, around jobs, around schools. It was just you don't feel safe. E equally, the point that was raised of people not wanting one party rule. That, again, that's just not the case. They literally just uh, had that in, tw in 2020. Uh, and so you have keep this in mind. Uh, you had every indication of her history that the Republicans should have had a great night. Why did they not yesterday? And why did that is not going to occur in this cycle? Because they had terrible candidates. You have someone in Herschel Walker who's an awful candidate. You have someone in Arizona, two people in Arizona. You have a gubernatorial candidate and a, and a secretary of state candidate that is publicly saying you should not trust the results unless I win. Right. So like when we're talking th this through, like very practically, you know, people are just saying like enough, you know, equally. Let's look at the data. Independence in a midterm election where we have the we have control broke for Democrats last night. Because at the end of the day, when people are asking and saying, you know what? Yes, we're realizing it's not perfect. We want things to be better. We want things to be different. However, when you assess what is happening in this country and where we are going in 2023 and beyond, presumably what's going to happen when you have a House that is barely led by Republicans, it looks like maybe a three seat majority. It looks like there will be a Democratic control in the Senate and, of course, a Democratic president. You're going to have a very clear indication about these two parties. What is the direction that the Republican Party wants to take when they really won't have true control? Will you try to actually work with the Democrats and move things forward when you have uh, seemingly the, the control of the House? Or will we go down a road where it's just essentially message bills and going after Joe Biden uh, for the sake of trying to win an election in 24? And so I think at the end of the day, Darren, uh, you know, I, I feel very confident uh, because you saw what happened across the country that people are not tolerating this nonsense. You, you saw in Kentucky, they rejected anti-abortion language. In Nebraska, they voted to increase minimum wage. People are looking to see that you're going to have clear guidance. And again, let's come back to New York. And this is why I think it's so critical. We're talking about message here. In a space where, yes, in areas, in particular Long Island, other than that, where you didn't really see significant growth and, 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 and increases that happened across the board, you had a bond act of $4.2 billion passed overwhelmingly and equally three racial justice acts and proposals. And then when someone will say to you, well, it's New York City, that would happen. They seem to forget that New York City had a Republican mayor for 20 years. So you can't just say, well, that just happened because you have so many Democrats. If you have a vision and you communicate that vision and you communicate why things will be better for you, people will believe in that. And I think that's what you're seeing in the 2022 midterm elections. Adam, I want to bring you in on this conversation here. When we talk about Republican messaging, obviously, uh, some people felt the Republican messaging wasn't too strong. That translated in the fact that Governor Hochul was able to come away, apparently, and be reelected. Uh, how did you feel about the messaging? I mean, uh, Mike and others have said that there was a, a focus on crime, uh, but there are several other issues that I think a lot of people in the state were really trying to key in on. And uh, it seems the Republicans fell, fell short in really addressing those matters. Look, I would agree with the notion that bad candidates don't do well. Candidates with no messaging generally don't do well. Um, but I don't know that I agree that there was no messaging from Republicans and that it hasn't been proven, you know, what happened yesterday. And, you know, if we're talking specifically here in New York, I mean, crime was a big issue. You may, Mike, you may not think it was a big issue. It was a big issue, I think, to a lot of people. Um, but the economy is another big issue. and. You know, you got to you got to marshal a plan and you got to prioritize that because it's it's it goes back to Maslow. Right. It's like food and safety. Right. Economy and crime. Right. Those are the two, I think, biggest issues that people worry about. Um, we know that New York is losing people, that the economy is not business friendly. So those are the things that I think that Lee and others started to marshal to garner support, which I think they did to a significant de degree outperforming significantly the last few uh, gubernatorial candidates. But, you know, you can look around the country 
for other Republicans who had messaging, who did very well, who outperformed, like, for example, Ron DeSantis, right? He beat Charlie Crist by 20 points, it looks like. Charlie Crist is a former governor of the state who, right, won statewide office. And what was, you know, what was Ron's message? You know, he, he cut taxes, he increased funding for schools, he increased teachers' pay. Um, these are the types of things I think voters liked. They liked his performance, but he, he governed as, as a Republican conservative, right? He kept schools open. Um, and that, that messaging clearly resonated resoundingly in Florida, particularly with the Hispanics, as you know, I think you, you may or may not know, but the governor won Miami-Dade County. That's the first time that's ever happened, maybe that a Republican won it, I don't know, in decades probably. And it's, it's a county of 2 million plus people with 70 plus percent Hispanics, and, and it, went, it went Republican. So that's all good news for the GOP. There's, there's good news for the GOP there. There's good news for the GOP in, in plenty of places. And I think if we can sort of move forward uh, with that sort of framework, I think we'll be in good shape. But in all fairness, though, Adam, let's talk about this, because when you look at what the messaging that was sent, uh, we saw Kevin McCarthy come out and say, listen, listen, we're, we're claiming we're claiming victory. That really wasn't the case right off the bat. I mean, as the time that we're going on air right now, there's still a lot to still be decided. Uh, but what was anticipated was that Republicans would really have a great stronghold going into this midterm election. They felt that the Biden administration wasn't performing in terms of policy, wasn't meeting the country's needs and the agenda. But yet and still, when we look at the numbers the way that they are, um, you have to admit that things did not plan out the way that Republicans actually planned. I admit that. There's no question about it. Right. And I think something Mike said resonates. It makes a lot of sense. Election deniers didn't do very well. There's a reason for that. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody believes that. That's a recipe for a loss. Okay? That's not a recipe for winning. You have to have ideas. And I think where you had candidates that had ideas like Ron DeSantis, who has a track record of, of you know, positive governance, he did resoundingly well. Good candidates with good messaging, with good track records do really well. Bad candidates with no messaging don't do well. That's common sense. And I agree with that 100%. But again, I also agree that, look, lots of people were thinking there was going to be a wave. It wasn't a wave. But I do think the country moved discernibly to the right. And I do think the GOP will take control of the House. Um, and I think that was, we're going to, you know, we know that was, if it happens, which I think it will, it's going to be fueled in large part by congressional races here in New York in a very deep blue state. And that's something that the GOP break, can be proud of. Mike, and after the break, Mike, I want you to address this comment about uh, President Joe Biden. If they are not able to win both the House and the Senate, what does that mean for the Biden administration and particularly the Democratic Party? We'll talk about that and more when we return right here on Perspectives. <laughs> Your own perspectives. Uh, Darren Jaime here with you, and uh, we've got two very special guests talking about the results. Now, we have to be very honest that uh, by the time we go to air right now, the results have still not fully come in, uh, but we're going on what we know as of right now, and what we know, particularly on a statewide level, uh, Governor Kathy Hochul with a win. Uh, also, we're looking statewide. Statewide races uh, appear to go towards the Democratic Party. Uh, Mike, I want to bring this in here because when we look on a national level, uh, there's some thought about how much President Donald Trump actually played a factor in this whole election result. Uh, of course, some trickle down to New York. 
But let me go to the Trump factor. Uh, how much was it a factor? How much did it hurt the Republican Party? Your thoughts? I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to waste my time on a loser. Right. Right. Democrats had a damn good night. I, I, I don't know why we keep talking about someone who lost, who continues to break the law, who is under continual indictments uh, and didn't win a damn thing of any consequence in the midterm elections. And until Republicans are willing to say enough where he's talking about, he has a major announcement on November 15th. Talk, talk about how uh, absolutely callous and absurd an individual has to be that before a midterm election where you're hoping your party wins again, that you're teasing out that you may do something for yourself on November 15th, which more than likely is about announcing uh, another run for the presidency, in, in, which again would be somewhat surreal. Uh, think about how he's in Florida and, and completely got worked uh, by what happened with DeSantis. Now let's transition to the points that were raised earlier uh, itself. De DeSantis didn't win because he had a, such a great message. DeSantis won because they had an overwhelming money advantage in the state of Florida. When, when you're in a scenario where essentially five to one of uh, the money that's being spent on paid communications, you can't ignore that reality um, there between his own committee and, and the additional committees uh, that were there. And then we think about uh, across uh, the country, whether it be New York on down, let, let's assess in the true battleground states what happened on election night. Pennsylvania, governor, victory for the Democrat, Senate, victory for the Democrat. Uh, Arizona, Democrats are ahead. Nevada, uh, as we wait, because you have to wait for all ballots that can, if a ballot's been postmarked as of Tuesday and is received on Saturday, where 70% of those come from Clark County. So you have to presume those are going to break their way. Right? Uh, you look at uh, Ohio is really not a true battleground right now. Florida is not a true battleground right now. Georgia, with everything they're doing, Warnock is ahead, right? And let's be honest, if you didn't have a spoiler who had 2.1% in the race, Warnock probably wins on election night uh, itself. Um, North Carolina, uh, where you had great pickups that happened locally in a race where they should have ran away from, uh, they pretty much only beat her by a point. So I, I, I'm trying to uh, ascertain where is this bad night for Democrats, right? Uh, and, and we think this through uh, itself. Yes, we, we know there's a runoff that's going to happen December 6th in Georgia. You know, when, when we think this through in terms of what's happening across the country, uh, the the I am still asking and wondering, what is the actual Republican message? I still haven't heard it. I'm still I'm still waiting. Other than someone saying you should be afraid of these people making you, you know, feel scared. What is what is the actual Republican message? Let me, let me bring Adam in. I mean, uh, Adam talking about this. As we said, there probably will be a runoff. In, in, uh, as a matter of fact, we're getting news that the New York Times has confirmed there will be a runoff in Georgia. Uh, but talk to me about this. Uh, how much did the Trump factor hurt uh, Republicans or did it help? Sure. No, I think I think it hurt Republicans. I think that the announce his announcement about an announcement, you know, a week before the election was not helpful. It just made him more sort of relevant. Um, and we look around the races where the sort of Trump backed candidates were on the ballot and they didn't do well. They haven't, they didn't win and they underperformed. Like even Vance out in Ohio, he's going to win. But I think he's the last number I saw was 54. De DeWine had 62 something, 62 plus percent, the governor, right? So that, so the Trump guy underperformed significantly. Uh, Herschel Walker in Georgia couldn't get 50%. I don't know whether that 2%, I thought it was a libertarian. You know, maybe it took from Warnock, maybe it took from Herschel. We'll see what the runoff does. But again, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania couldn't couldn't do it, right? Trump back candidate. And, you know, Dr. Oz was running against a guy who had some difficulties, right, towards the end. Um, so still couldn't put it over, over the over, over the finish line. But look at Kemp. Look at DeSantis. Guys who didn't go and seek out Donald Trump's backing or endorsement, et cetera, overperformed, performed very, very well. Gentlemen with track records of governing a state, which I think, you know, you know, govern according to Republican conservative principles and have done really well and their states are doing really well. And the voters, you know, I think rewarded them for that. And, you know, I, I don't I haven't seen the money disadvantage or advantages in Florida spent. But like the state this won by 30,000 votes four years ago. It was a deep purple and he turned it into deep red. And, and to say that it's just money, I mean. You know, I don't think money buys elections. I think performance and messaging, but you know, wins elections.
Yeah, Mike, let me bring in here. Uh, a lot of people disappointed that uh, Stacey Abrams was not able to pull it off. They thought that she was the one that actually, well, she was uh, the one that actually did voter mobilization that really changed the Democratic Party to getting to win the White House and also the Senate and then also the congressional seats, but not able to bring it home in our own area. Where did she go from here? Before, before we go to Georgia, again, I just want to make sure we're clear. The Republican Party outspent the Democratic Party in Florida in the gubernatorial race by $252 million. Okay. $252 million. So it is one. And then equally on the substance, I want to say Florida is last in the country, if not 49th, when it comes to education. I mean, in terms of the actual successes of these states, we can't ignore the power of the incumbency uh, in some of these places uh, matter. As it relates to Georgia for Stacey, uh, look, we, 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 th there are scenarios where you have to communicate why to break from an incumbent. And, and, I, do, and I think this is telling, right? We, 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 we have this narrative of, well, why couldn't Stacey pull it off? Well, she was running against an incumbent, you know, same way Herschel Walker is running against an incumbent in, Wal in Warnock, right? You do have to communicate why the person that was elected should not be there any longer. And there are ways to articulate that, right? There, we have seen, and we saw that uh, throughout this midterm election, that, that incumbents do go down when you make a clear argument against them. And, and in those instances, uh, that, that clearly did not happen. But again, I will continue to communicate this for December 6th here and beyond. Uh, when you have on one side, a party that is articulating that, yes, things are challenging, but we are moving forward and making progress versus on the other side, we are not hearing what that is. Voters are saying to you very clearly that they're going to stay with the Democratic side. I only have a couple of seconds. I might say I have a couple. I mean, really a couple. Uh, Adam, let me get some last thoughts from you. Sure. I mean, I think Tuesday night was not what Republicans were hoping, but I do think that there were some victories that the Republicans should be proud of. And I think the most important takeaway is that the future of the Republican Party should be DeSantis and not Trump. All right, Mike. If Ron DeSantis is the future of the Republican Party, I look forward to Democrats winning again in 2024. Well, we'll see. Enough said. Both of you have uh, exercised some great points. Uh, great having you. Great conversation, honestly. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to determine, uh, hopefully by the next time we meet, uh, who the actual winners are. There's still a lot up for grabs. Of course, we've not determined yet the Senate and the House. That is still uh, up for debate. Still waiting on these key states to come in. But one state that we can talk about that we know very sure here in New York, which all of us are in, uh, Governor Kathy Hochul, and it appears to be uh, pretty much a Democratic statewide win. I'm Darren Hyman for us here on Perspectives. Thank you for joining us. Until the next time we meet, we encourage you to stay safe, share your perspective with somebody else you don't know. It just might make a difference in someone else's life. Take care and we'll see you on the next show.